I would like to welcome you to part 9 of this 10-part online training program on adaptive designs and clinical trial simulation. We have two modules left and in this video I will introduce a new class of adaptive designs. They are known as adaptive designs with population selection. And in very simple terms, adaptive designs in this class are multi-stage trial designs that enable the trial sponsor to identify the most promising patient population or potentially several patient populations, which would include the overall population of patients in the trial, as well as two or maybe more predefined subsets of patients. So when we compare a treatment selection and population selection trial designs, there are quite a few similarities. And therefore, some of the concepts I'm going to present in this video are similar to what we discussed back in part 7. Because in both cases, our ultimate goal is to identify the best features for the final efficacy evaluation. This means most promising trial arms or most promising subsets of patients for the final analysis. But there are also some quite unique features unique considerations that are specific to this class of adaptive trials that enable data-driven population selection. And I will expand upon this later in this video. Once again, the new class of adaptive trial designs I'm going to introduce in this video is the class of designs that support data-driven population selection based on the results of an interim assessment. This adaptive approach is less popular than adaptive designs with sample size estimation or in general with event counter estimation. These designs are most relevant in fairly special cases where we expect a certain amount of heterogeneity in the patient population, which means that there are patients with a certain type of characteristics who are expected to experience a stronger beneficial effect compared to the other patients. And in this case, it would be most meaningful to design the trial in such a way that this additional information would be taken into account. It would help the trial sponsor better characterize the efficacy and potentially safety profiles of the investigational therapy. And within an adaptive framework, the degree of treatment effect heterogeneity could be examined at an interim analysis and this interim assessment would then inform the design of the rest of the, of the trial, the second stage of the trial. For example, it could be best to perform the final evaluation of the treatment effect only in the subset of patients with certain characteristics, or in certain cases, it would be most meaningful to proceed with the original pre-specified analysis and uh, examine the magnitude of the treatment benefit in the overall population of patients, which means that a decision rule could be applied at the time of an interim assessment to choose the most promising patient population and the most meaningful scientific hypotheses for the final analysis. And uh, this is how we define adaptive population selection designs. We're going to begin with a motivating example that will help us understand key considerations for adaptive designs in this class. It is the Saturn trial, which I introduced back in part two. It will be used for this purpose. And in addition to that, I'm going to introduce a case study that will help us understand key features of adaptive population selection designs. It will be based, as you can see, on a phase three trial in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Beginning with a motivating example, I will spend a few minutes on this slide because we need to introduce a few key concepts that will play a central role in this module. As I pointed out at the beginning of this video, today we will uh, study, we will examine, we will discuss another popular class of adaptive designs known as population selection designs. And the natural question to ask is what does it mean and why would we have several populations in a single trial to begin with? 
And before I tell you more about the Saturn trial, let me step back and talk a bit about the so-called multi-population trials. The general multi-population approach goes back to the concept of tailored therapeutics and personalized medicine. These innovative ideas resulted in increased attention to the evaluation of treatment effects in certain predefined, focused, sensitive subpopulations in clinical trials. And there have been multiple examples of investigational therapies that, based on their mechanism of action, they were expected to deliver the main benefit, not necessarily in the oral population of patients with this with the condition of interest, but that efficacy beneficial effect could be limited to a certain subset of the overall population. And patients in the subset would be more likely to respond to this therapy than patients in the complementary subset. And it is generally possible that patients in the complementary subset may not experience any beneficial effect at all. The subset would most commonly be defined using genetic markers, but sometimes certain demographic or clinical characteristics could be used, perhaps even a combination of those characteristics. That's where we sometimes talk about biomarker signatures as opposed to a single biomarker to define a subset of the overall population. And probably the most famous example would be the Herceptin trials in women with breast cancer. And later, similar evaluations were performed for other tumor types. These Herceptin trials selected patients who were HER2 receptor positive, and here HER2 is a certain type of growth factor receptor. A very important feature of those trials was that patients who were not HER2 receptor positive, that is, patients who were in the complementary subset of the overall patient population, simply were not enrolled at all. And the clinical trial revealed that Herceptin was a very effective treatment for breast cancer within this focus subset of the overall population. And those trials and other trials that utilize a similar approach helped realize the promise of tailored therapeutics. As the next step, trial sponsors started introducing more complex design, more complex sets of objectives, for example, to assess the treatment effects in focused populations, as well as the overall patient patient population. And this more general approach is known as a multi-population tailoring approach, and it offers multiple advantages over trials with a single population that are also known as single population trials. The main advantage is that these multi-population trials support an assessment of treatment effects for multiple potential overlapping populations within a single trial, which makes them more efficient than the traditional approach of conducting several single population trials. And then multi-population trials are more informative for this reason than traditional single population trials. And I would like to stress that the key assumption for a multi-population tailoring approach is that those focused subpopulations that are predefined in the trial and they are part of a planned analysis strategy and all of the details of the subpopulation specifications should be included in the trial protocol. With this foundation in mind, we are now ready to go back to the Saturn trial that will serve as a motivating example in this module. And the main reason I'm going to use this trial as a motivating example is that most likely this was the first successful clinical trial that took full advantage of a multi-population paradigm so let's take a look at the trial's design and it, uh, the objectives formulated uh, for uh, this trial. This trial, first of all, was conducted to investigate the efficacy and safety of an experimental treatment that uh, was called erlotinib versus control, which was standard of care. And the primary efficacy assessment was performed using a time-to-event endpoint. It was, in this case, progressions-free survival, also known as PFS. And PFS is defined as the time from the time a patient is randomized uh, to either disease progression or death. And the goal, of course, would be to prolong progression-free survival. Also, as I pointed out in the 
introductory module, this particular trial did not employ an adaptive approach, but I believe, and I will provide some examples to back it up, I believe that an adaptive design with population selection could have been employed in this trial, and it would have definitely helped make this trial more informative, and it could have helped improve the probability of success by identifying the best patient population for the final assessment. So as we said, a multi-population tailoring approach was used in the Saturn trial. In addition to investigating the, the efficacy in the oral population of enrolled patients with non-small cell lung cancer, the trial sponsor made it clear from the very beginning that an efficacy assessment will also be performed in a predefined subset of the overall population. The subset was defined using a certain baseline patient characteristic, a biomarker to be more specific. This biomarker was based on a receptor defined on the slide known as EGFR, which stands for the Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor. This biomarker played a very important role in the development of this um, experimental treatment, and it was believed to be predictive of treatment response because erlotinib, the experimental treatment in the study, was an EGFR inhibitor. And based on this biomarker, patients at the time of enrollment were classified as either biomarker positive or biomarker negative. A greater beneficial effect was expected in patients who were classified as biomarker positive compared to biomarker negative patients included in the complementary subset. So as, as, as you can see, a fair amount of heterogeneity was expected in the trial's overall patient population. To account for this information, for this uh, heterogeneity, a multi-population design was employed in the Saturn trial. Once again, this was one of the first successful applications of a multi-population approach. According to this multi-population design, the treatment effect was evaluated at the final analysis. Again, this was not a, an adaptive design. This particular trial res, relied on a traditional approach. So there was only one decision point. The treatment benefit was evaluated only at the final analysis in two patient populations. The first one being the overall population of patients and the second one, the predefined subset of EGFR positive patients. This multi-population approach that was used in this trial helped the sponsor develop a more robust approach to analyzing the experimental therapy's effects in the presence of the anticipated heterogeneity of the beneficial effect. And the design of the two patient populations enabled the sponsor to pursue those two objectives that are equally scientifically valid in a single trial as opposed to conducting two separate trials. If the original hypothesis was true and the selected biomarker was indeed predictive of treatment response, then a strong effect would have been detected in the subset of biomarker positive patients. But the treatment effect in a complementary subset of biomarker negative patients could have be much weaker and the overall effect would be diluted due to those biomarker negative patients. So it is theoretically possible that the sponsor would only be able to establish a statistically significant beneficial effect only in the subpopulation of biomarker positive patients, but not in the overall population. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that it is possible that the selected biomarker was not that strong from a predictive perspective, and all patients enrolled in the trial could equally benefit from the experimental treatment. In this case, a statistical significant effect would be established in the overall population of patients, and the effect in the biomarker positive subpopulation may or may not be strongly beneficial. So this multi-population design was introduced to help the sponsor account for those two options. As I said earlier, the Saturn trial would have been a great example to use in this module, but this trial relied on a traditional design with a fixed number of events and a single decision point at the final analysis. And the case study defined on the slide, as well as the next several slides, provides an attempt 
to extend the original design that was used in the Saturn trial to an adaptive setting with two interim analyses. This is the reason why most design elements in this case study are quite similar to what uh, was assumed was used in the Saturn trial. Specifically, the patient population is the same as you can see on the slide. Uh, we assume here in this case study patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. The primary efficacy endpoints is again defined based on uh, PFS, PF progression free survival. And also a multi-population design would be employed in this case study. We will also assume, as in the Saturn trial, that we have a biomarker-based classifier. Using this classifier, at the time of patient enrollment, we will define a group of patients who are more likely to experience a beneficial effect. They are more likely to respond to the experimental treatment. They will be labeled biomarker-positive patients. And patients in the complementary group would be referred to as biomarker negative patients. Those patients are less likely to respond. And uh, we will introduce the following notation that we will use throughout this module. The overall patient population will be denoted by OP. And the subset, the subpopulation of biomarker positive patients will be denoted by B+. And we're planning to design an adaptive population trial for this case study. And uh, it will be helpful to mention alternative terminology here very quickly. Uh, when we talk about adaptive population selection designs, I would like to clarify that adaptive designs in this class are also sometimes referred to as population enrichment designs because the trial sponsor could use the interim data to enrich the patient population by switching from the overall population to a predefined subset of patients, biomarker positive patients, for the final assessment. This process is known as enrichment because the sponsor expects a stronger beneficial effect within the subset. So this decision to change the patient population will strengthen the likelihood of success in the trial. But personally, I prefer a more general term such as population selection because the adaptive designs we're going to discuss today could support potential other decisions instead of just replacing the overall population with a biomarker positive subpopulation for the purposes of the final efficacy assessment. The trial sponsor may decide to also ex expand the final analysis by examining the treatment effect in overall population and also in the biomarker positive subpopulation. So there will be two objectives of the final analysis. So this approach generally goes beyond the goals of pure population enrichment, and I will go over those details in just a few minutes. The following decision points will be used in this adaptive trial. As I said a few minutes um, ago, this case study will be an extension of the Saturn trial by, by employing an adaptive approach and in this case, two interim assessments will be assumed. The first interim analysis will be introduced to support a futility stopping rule in the overall population. And then when we get to the second interim analysis, we will have enough data to confidently support a population selection rule. And I would like to point out that, um, as I have in the context of um, two other classes of adaptive designs that I presented earlier in this training program is that, of course, other types of decision rules could be considered in this trial if they are clinically relevant. And those other types of decision rules could include an efficacy stopping rule at either interim analysis and a rule for updating the target number of events in the trial. And looking very quickly at the efficacy stopping rule, the trial could be stopped due to superior efficacy most likely in the overall population of patients at an interim assessment. And the event counter estimation rule could be considered most likely at the time of the second interim analysis to make appropriate adjustments in the trial's design with the goal of improving the probability of success in the trial. And the rules for event counter estimation in this class of adaptive trials are typically set up to be aligned with the population selection rules for example, if we think about a scenario where the data at the second interim analysis indicate that all patients 
regardless of their biomarker status, respond to the experimental treatment, then it would be best to perform the final assessment in the overall population, and therefore a decision to update the target number of events would be reasonable in this case if the overall efficacy signal was weaker than expected, but it would be much more relevant to consider the option to increase the target, target number of events if the efficacy signal was present mostly in biomarker positive patients, which means that the final assessment in the trial would be performed in the biomarker positive subpopulation. We should not forget that it is quite common for the prevalence of biomarker positive patients to be less than 50%, and this means that the expected number of events in this biomarker positive subset will be much smaller than the number of events in the overall population, which directly implies that there's a higher chance that the efficacy assessment within the biomarker positive subpopulation will be underpowered. It would be quite important to enable event count estimation under that scenario. Now continuing to the final analysis, the trial sponsor is interested in pursuing the following objectives for the final assessment. Uh, those as, uh, objectives include the evaluation of the treatment effect in the overall population. In a very similar fashion, the treatment effect could be evaluated in the predefined subset of biomarker positive patients. And the last objective is quite interesting where a two-fold objective could be pursued predefined for the final assessment where the treatment effect will be examined in the overall population as well as the biomarker positive subset. So those objectives should be driven by general scientific requirements and they correspond to the scientific hypothesis of interest for tailored therapies in general and we will discuss those details uh, later in this video. Let me add a few additional details about this case study. This includes enrollment information and other details on the slide, and uh, we'll also take a look at treatment effect assumptions for this oncology trial on the next two slides. We've already talked on multiple occasions about the importance of patient enrollment assumptions in the context of general adaptive trials. In this case, the length of the patient enrollment period is assumed to be 18 months, and the patient discontinuation or dropout rate is defined on an annual basis. Every year, 5% of patients are assumed to be lost to follow up. And in this case, which is a standard assumption in oncology trials, we assume that the time to the event of patient discontinuation follows an exponential distribution. The sample size, specifically the total number of enrolled patients, is set at 960 patients. And we also need to define the target number of events for two different objectives in this trial. And I would like to point out that in the standard setting, with a single population, we would have specified the target number of events only for the overall population. But in this case, Two patient populations are predefined, and therefore we will have to set the target number of events for each population. Specifically, as you see at the bottom of the slide, we expect to continue the trial until 700 patients are accrued in the overall population of patients. But if a decision is made to modify the patient population and perform the final efficacy assessment only in the patients with a biomarker positive status, then in that case, the milestone for the final analysis will be driven by the requirement to accrue 300 patients in the biomarker positive subset. When designing a multi-population trial, we need to specify treatment effect assumptions or scenarios for each of the two subpopulations. The biomarker negative subpopulation as well as the biomarker positive subpopulation as I said before, my general recommendation for any adaptive design will be to consider several sets of assumptions and then run clinical trial simulations to compute key operating characteristics for each scenario with the ultimate goal being to arrive at an adaptive design that guarantees desirable performance across multiple plausible sets of treatment effect assumptions. This slide presents 
one set of assumptions that could be used to design a an adaptive trial for this particular case study. And this particular set of assumptions does a very good job of illustrating the fact that the chosen biomarker, that binary classifier that is used for grouping patients into biomarker negative and biomarker positive patients, has indeed predictive properties. It is helping us predict treatment response. Specifically, if we look at the assumptions for the median PFS time in the biomarker negative subpopulation, we see here that the treatment is expected to provide some improvement over the control arm, but that improvement is probably just borderline clinically relevant. The median PFS time is only expected to go up from 11 months to 13 months. However, if we now switch to the subset of biomarker positive patients, we see that the fact that those patients have a positive biomarker status is highly predictive of a stronger beneficial effect. In this case, the median PFS time in the control arm uh, is set to 11 or expected to be 11 months, and it's expected to be improved all the way up to 15.7 months. Another important parameter of adaptive designs with population selection and multi-population designs in general is the prevalence of biomarker positive patients. In this case, we assume that the prevalence is 50%. This assumption is typically based on relevant historical data and will determine the relative sizes of the biomarker positive and biomarker negative subsets. In this case, those two subsets are expected to be of the same size. On this slide, we will continue reviewing the treatment effect assumptions in each population of interest. The overall population and the biomarker positive subpopulation. And we're going to switch to a hazard ratio scale from the median PFS time because it is very common in survival trials to quantify the magnitude of the treatment effect using hazard ratios based on the assumptions around the median PFS time presented on the previous slide. We can easily compute, assuming the underlying exponential distribution, that the hazard ratio in the subset of patients with a biomarker positive status is equal to 0.7, which is a fairly solid value for a hazard ratio in an oncology study. And by contrast, if we now switch to the overall population, by looking at the mixture of two different subpopulations, we can derive the hazard ratio in the overall population. It happens to be only 0.85. So it is much closer to one. And that suggests that the overall population effect is somewhat diluted by including patients with a biomarker positive status. In this case, we make a standard assumption that a hazard ratio below one indicates a beneficial treatment effect. And the effect size, just like in all other survival trials, in this case will be defined as the negative logarithm of the hazard ratio. And the effect sizes will be denoted by theta zero. That's the effect size for the overall population. And theta plus would denote the effect size for the biomarker positive subpopulation. Using this definition, the resulting effect sizes would have the same interpretation as effect sizes in trials with continuous or binary efficacy endpoints. In this section, we will get to go over key parameters of the population selection design proposed for this case study. We will begin with the general recommendations around selecting the timing or information fractions for each interim look in the trial. As before, as we did it in parts five and seven, we're dealing here with three-stage design and the stages will be defined in a standard way. We're not going to spend any time on this. The main question here is, how do we choose the information fraction or the information cut for the first interim look, which is designed to support the futility assessment in the overall population of patients? Theoretically, of course, if it is appropriate, we could consider a futility stopping rule for the predefined subpopulation of uh, biomarker positive patients. But for now, for simplicity, 
let us assume that our main objective here is to determine whether or not it is worthwhile continuing the trial based on the efficacy signal in the overall population of patients. Given that this is a futility assessment, or as we referred to it before, a go-no-go -go decision rule, it would be most sensible to schedule this interim assessment fairly early in the trial. For example, the information fraction at this interim analysis could be set to 30%, which means that the interim analysis will be performed after 30% of the target number of events in the overall population have been accrued, which will be 700 events times 30% uh, will give us uh, 210 events at this milestone. This is how the cutoff date for this interim assessment will be determined. And this recommendation is, of course, consistent with the recommendations we uh, went over, we discussed in the context of other adaptive designs. What about the second interim analysis? What would be a meaningful information fraction or perhaps a range of information fractions for an interim assessment which is designed to help us identify the base patient population for the final analysis. Here, the general arguments will be quite similar to what we discussed in the context of sample size reestimation designs that we talked about back in part five. Because here, to support a population selection decision, it will be very helpful to have a reliable estimate of the beneficial effect, or in this case, this would be the hazard ratio in each of the two patient populations in the trial. And from this perspective, the most meaningful approach will be to go for a late interim analysis, perhaps considering an interim look that corresponds to the information fraction of 60% or even 70%. For example, if we assume, as shown on the slide, that the information fraction is set to 60%, then in the context of our case study, the resulting number of events will be 700 events at the final analysis. We'll multiply it by the information fraction by 60%. That will give us 420 events in the overall population at the time as a milestone for the second interim analysis. And with this many events, we can confidently and reliably estimate the effect sizes or hazard ratios in the overall population, which will ultimately enable reliable population selection. But what about the subpopulation of biomarker positive patients? How many events should we expect within that subpopulation at the second interim analysis? In general, I would say there is no simple method for computing the expected number of events for this subpopulation, and that's where we need to rely on uh, simulations. The clinical trial simulation approach would come in quite handy. It would be quite important to ensure that a sufficiently large number of events will be available at the time of this interim assessment within the subpopulation, and that will help us reliably estimate the hazard ratio for biomarker positive patients. And um, if the projected number of events based on simulations is low, then of course we could consider adjusting the information fraction for this interim analysis. For example, a later interim analysis uh, could be considered. And the last point I'd like to make on this slide is that just like with the other types of adaptive designs that we have discussed so far, it will be important to estimate the timing of the second interim analysis with respect to the end of the patient enrollment period. As I said before, in the context of adaptive designs with sample size reestimation, the general recommendation is to schedule the second interim analysis where the sample size could be updated before the patient enrollment is closed in the trial. It makes a lot of practical sense um, that would be desirable from an operational perspective and it will ensure an interrupted, an, an, an interrupted process of patient enrollment in the trial. Another question is, would that kind of consideration be important in adaptive designs that utilize population selection? And the answer would be yes and no. And I will explain this in a bit more detail. To help us answer this question, it will be very helpful to step back and think about the consequences of a decision 
to select the biomarker positive subpopulation for the final analysis. If the second interim analysis is held before the end of patient enrollment, then patients with a biomarker negative status will no longer be enrolled after this interim analysis, because after all, there's little evidence that biomarker negative patients benefit from the experimental treatment. And then from an overall uh, efficiency perspective, this will help reduce the total number of biomarker negative patients who will not be included in the final assessment, of course. But most likely this reduction will be relatively small, which means that the decision to schedule the second interim analysis before the end of patient enrollment is not really a critical consideration for this class of adaptive designs. So even, even if the second interim analysis happens to be performed quite late in the trial, after the end of the patient enrollment period, it would still be quite meaningful to apply a population selection rule. There is still a good chance that this decision to select the overall population may be made at the decision point, in which case there is no need to worry at all about those efficiency considerations. We are now ready to go over key considerations for the individual interim assessments for the first and second interim looks. So let's begin with interim analysis number one. I presented general recommendations for selecting the timing of the first interim analysis a few minutes ago. And we concluded that an early interim analysis would be most sensible, would be recommended for a futility assessment. In this case study, a more aggressive approach uh, will be justified. The information fraction at this interim analysis will actually be set to 20%, mostly to reduce the number of patients enrolled into the trial by this interim analysis in case the trial is terminated for futility. This figure will help us understand the reasons why such an aggressive approach with a very early interim look is warranted in this case study. In simple terms, the timing of this interim analysis, as well as, of course, the second interim analysis, will be driven in this trial by a certain predefined number of events rather than the number of evaluable patients. And uh, it is generally the case in oncology studies that the rate at which patients are enrolled into a trial and the rate at which the events are accrued could be quite different. And this may result in a considerable gap between the number of neural patients and the event count. So let's take a closer look at this figure. This figure is conceptually similar to plots that we considered in the context of other adaptive designs, for example, in parts um, 5 and 7. But there's one very important difference. When we look at this figure, there are two curves, the yellow curve and the red curve. And as before, the yellow curve here defines the cumulative number of enrolled patients in the trial. And the red curve defines the cumulative number of events. You can see here that those, uh, that they, um, they, those curves uh, uh, follow different rates. They have uh, uh, quite, quite different uh, slopes. And that's exactly the uh, phenomenon that I alluded to uh, a couple of uh, minutes a uh, ago when I pointed out that there could be a fairly significant mismatch between the number of enrolled patients and the number of events at an interim assessment. And in this case, as we said before, the interim analysis, the first interim analysis, will be performed after the 140th event is accrued in the study. This target for the number of events corresponds to the horizontal dashed line and using the same trick that we used before, we can easily determine the milestone for this first interim analysis by uh, looking for the point where the horizontal line crosses the red curve. That is expected to occur in this particular case at about 10.1 months after the study start. And it's quite easy to check that by that milestone, and we can do that by drawing a vertical line at 10.1 months at that milestone, we can very easily check that quite a few patients, in this particular case, about 521 patients will actually be enrolled by that time, which is over 50% of the total sample size. And that is exactly the reason why an early interim look uh, 
that supports futility assessment should be considered in this case study. The futility stopping rule will be defined in a very standard way at this interim analysis. It will be defined using conditional power or predicted probability of success at the end of the trial given the data available to the trial sponsor at the time of the interim analysis and the trial will be stopped for futility or in other words for due to lack of efficacy in the overall population if the resulting conditional power is quite low for example it could be below the 10 percent uh, threshold here on the slide we give a formal definition for conditional power we have seen this definition before and therefore we'll continue straight to the next slide it is very helpful as i've explained before to connect the dots so to speak and help research teams or the trial sponsor to calibrate the threshold for conditional power that will be used in the futility stopping rule i emphasized it earlier in parts five and seven so let us examine a plot this plot that will help us potentially understand how to interpret in tangible terms a threshold for conditional power in this particular case study just like we did before uh, we created plots that compared the um, more tangible effects uh, such as the effect sizes in the control and treatment arms to the resulting level of conditional power in this case in this uh, in this figure we have the median pfs time expressed in months in the treatment arm plotted on the vertical axis and the similar quantity median pfs time in the control arm shown on the horizontal axis and for a particular set of assumptions for example let's assume for the sake of illustration that at the time of this first interim analysis the observed median pfs times in the control and treatment arms are equal to 11.5 months and 12.6 months which obviously corresponds to a very small amount of improvement this difference in the median pfs times is far from being clinically relevant let's see what level of conditional power this particular delta this particular hazard ratio corresponds to and we can do that by drawing uh, the vertical and horizontal dashed lines based on the assumptions they crossed at the point which is close to the red diagonal lines and at that diagonal lines a line the conditional power level is equal to 20 percent so again we can use this type of a uh, visual tool to help research teams understand how what, what impact um, the threshold for conditional power will have on the decision to stop the study for futility in very practical terms on this slide i'm going to present the same summary as before these are commonly used rules of thumb across a very broad class of adaptive designs as we have said before we could apply consider a lower value for the conditional power threshold for example as low as uh, 10 percent that will generally trigger early termination only if the efficacy signal is very weak and in certain types of clinical trials including oncology trials for example the case study we're considering right now the sponsor may want to consider a um, higher threshold for example 20 or 30 percent that will ultimately uh, translate into a more aggressive quote-unquote rule for 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 fertility assessment and also as i pointed out before one could potentially consider a mathematically optimal approach based on the specificity and sensitivity rates to choose the best threshold for conditional power at an early interim analysis we are ready to proceed to interim analysis number two at this interim analysis we assume that the information cut or information fraction is set to 60 percent and as i explained earlier this means that this interim analysis will be performed after approximately 420 events have been accrued in the overall populations i explained a few slides back that considerations related to patient enrollment are generally not that relevant for this class of adaptive designs uh, compared for example to adaptive designs that support sample size or event count 
reestimation, it is not generally required to schedule the second intraanalysis before the patient enrollment period, but it may still be informative to review a figure like this one that once again uh, here compares the number of uh, uh, patients and events as a function of time from the uh, study start. In this case, if we assume once again that the intraanalysis will be held after the 420th event, then the corresponding milestone will be about 20 months. And it's clear from this figure that by that time, all patients will be enrolled into the trial. But generally, once again, this should not uh, be considered as a, as a limitation, as a downside. We could still have um, an informative adaptive design, even if the second interim analysis is held fairly late, uh, for example, after the end of patient enrollment. What is much more relevant in the context of adaptive designs with population selection is to define a meaningful and logically consistent set of population selection rules. Those rules, as I indicated before, are planned to be applied at the second interim analysis. And we will begin by setting a general stage, a general foundation for this discussion. I'm going to first introduce most popular objectives that sponsors or research teams formulate in multi-population trials. And for this purpose, I'm going to use the terminology commonly used in pharmaceutical drug development, such as regulatory claims. Uh, and by this general framework, I would like to point out is applicable to a very broad set of randomized studies. And all we need to do here is to replace the word claim by the word conclusion, for example, a scientific conclusion. So here we go back to the three possible objectives for the final analysis. Uh, they are defined on the slide from left to right. And those objectives are to, based on the interim analysis data, is to select the claim or the, 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 the objective of assessing the treatment effect in the overall population, number one. Secondly, assessing the effect in the biomarker positive subset. And finally, pursuing a twofold uh, objective uh, that includes the assessment in the overall population and the biomarker positive sub subset simultaneously. Those individual claims or conclusions are known typically as, uh, as you can see on the slide, as a broad claim of treatment effectiveness. Secondly, a restricted claim of treatment effectiveness. And the last one, this uh, twofold objective, could support an enhanced claim of treatment effectiveness. And this last claim of enhanced claim or enhanced conclusion would be scientifically justified only in the presence of of a strong differential treatment effect. What I mean by this is that there is evidence of a beneficial effect across the overall population in the trial, regardless of the biomarker status. But in addition to that, there is clear evidence of enhanced efficacy in the biomarker positive subpopulation, meaning that biomarker positive patients are much more likely to respond to this new treatment or this new intervention compared to biomarker negative patients. If this information is available, then it will help prescribing physicians identify the most appropriate treatment for a given patient. Over the next few slides, I will introduce a decision-making framework, which is specific to population selection. I refer to this framework uh, briefly at the very beginning of this module when I said that I'm going to present certain considerations that are unique to multi-population trials and adaptive designs with population selection rules. This decision-making framework was introduced in a series of papers written by myself and my colleagues about 10 years ago. And this framework has been applied to a number of traditional trials that evaluated tailored therapies. And more recently, uh, we've applied it to two adaptive designs that supported data-driven population selection. So stepping back here, I would like to begin by saying that a key idea behind this framework is that trial sponsors and research teams need to remember that scientific hypotheses formulated and tested in multi-population trials are logically related to each other. 
So uh, to define clinically relevant rules for population selection, we need to account for those logical relationships. The resulting decision rules would then guide the process of identifying the most appropriate scientific hypotheses to be tested at the final analysis, and they will ultimately facilitate the interpretation of outcomes in adaptive population selection trials. This decision-making framework relies on two conditions. that are known as the influence condition and the interaction condition. We're going to go over them in just a minute. And these conditions were introduced initially as tools for formulating meaningful regulatory claims for tailored therapies in pharmaceutical development uh, programs. And the conditions are easily extended to an adaptive design setting, and they can guide the process of identifying the um, appropriate, most relevant scientific hypotheses that would be tested at the final analysis based on the results available to the sponsor at, an, at the time of an interim assessment. So to define the influence and interaction conditions, I will use the standard notation for effect sizes in the two subpopulations of interest and in adaptive population selection designs. Uh, we will um, denote the effect sizes in the biomarker positive and biomarker negative subpopulations by theta plus and theta minus respectively. And um, a few slides back, we talked about the definition of effect sizes in survival trials. The effect size is defined as the negative logarithm of the hazard ratio. The first condition I will, I will introduce is the influence condition. It is natural to start with the influence condition because those two conditions, influence and interaction conditions, are applied sequentially. The influence condition is always followed by the interaction condition. I'll explain this in a minute. I think it will be best to adopt an example or case study-driven approach and begin with this example based on this confirmatory study in patients with a glioblastoma. It is based on a recent publication and um, looking at the results at the evidence of effectiveness in the individual subpopulations, as you can see on the slide, biomarker positive and biomarker negative, we see that the hazard ratio in the biomarker positive subset was very impressive. It was 0.1. Once again, the hazard ratio below 1 indicates a beneficial effect. And by contrast, when we now look at the biomarker negative subpopulation, there was no evidence of a beneficial effect. If anything, there was some suggestion of a negative trend because the hazard ratio lambda minus was actually much greater than 1. It was equal to 1.6. So assuming those results and uh, assuming that those represent not the hazard ratios estimated at the final analysis, let's assume that these are the hazard ratios that were estimated at an interim analysis. What we would like to, what we'd like to do here is we would like to determine the most scientifically meaningful claim or the most uh, meaningful conclusion for the final assessment for the choice of the hypothesis to be tested at the final analysis in those two subpopulations. Is it fair to conclude, for example, that this, this experimental treatment is effective across the entire patient population, in which case the final analysis should be set up to test this overall effect or do you think it would be more reasonable, more meaningful to say that the beneficial effect here is clearly restricted to the subpopulation of biomarker positive patients? In which case, of course, the best course of action would be to redefine the goals of the final assessment and only focus on the final analysis in the biomarker positive subpopulation. How do we answer those questions? Well, this takes us directly to the influence condition. If we consider a general clinical trial, which is conducted to investigate the efficacy of an experimental treatment in the general multi-population setting, for example, in the oral population of patients, as well as a prospectively defined subpopulation, then we need to make sure first that the overall treatment effect is not completely driven by a very strong effect in the subpopulation. That's exactly where the influence condition comes in. And this condition states that 
the conclusion of an overall effect is meaningful only if a, if a beneficial treatment effect in the overall population is not restricted to the subpopulation. What does it mean mathematically? Well, mathematically, this means that the influence condition is met if the efficacy signal is sufficiently strong in the biomarker negative subpopulation. That's where this formula uh, comes in. This formula states that the effect size in the biomarker negative subset, denoted by theta minus, should exceed a predefined threshold, denoted by C inf. And here, this threshold should be greater than, uh, greater or, or equal to zero. And most commonly, this effect is indeed set to zero, which implies that we expect to see some evidence of a beneficial effect in patients with a biomarker negative status. When we apply the influence condition to adaptive designs with population selection, we then define the first population selection rule as uh, we see on this slide. And what I mean by the um, uh, first population selection rule, because there will be another rule uh, based on the interaction uh, condition, as stated on this slide, when we invoke the influence condition, then if this condition is not met, then the best conclusion will be that a beneficial effect in the overall population is indeed driven by highly beneficial effect within the biomarker positive subpopulation. But if this condition is met, then the final analysis will be performed in the overall population, which will correspond to a broad claim. Otherwise, when the condition is not met, then the most sensible conclusion, the most sensible decision will be to think about the final analysis only in the context of the biomarker positive subpopulation, which would correspond then to the restricted claim. If we now go back to example one, let's uh, apply this logic, this influence condition to this particular trial. We uh, assume here once again that the hazard ratios or effect sizes that we see in the study quantify the treatment effects at an interim analysis and we would like to use those estimates to identify the most meaningful scientific hypotheses, conclusions that will be tested at the final analysis, uh, given this uh, interim analysis results. As uh, to remind you once again that the hazard ratios in the biomarker positive and negative subpopulations were equal to 0.5 and 1.6 respectively. So by applying the log transformation and computing the effect size as the negative logarithm of the hazard ratio, we can compute the effect sizes of 0.69, it's denoted by theta plus, and the effect size for biomarker negative patients is theta minus, it's equal to negative 0.47. In this case, if we apply the influence condition with the threshold set to zero, then a restricted claim would be recommended, which means that only the subset of biomarker positive patients will be selected for the final assessment. And of course, the final analysis is only going to be um, focusing on uh, assessing the, the significance of the treatment effect within this uh, population. Let us continue to the interaction condition. The influence condition, as we said, is only the first step. After we evaluate this condition, we proceed to what's known as the interaction condition. So here I'm going to introduce and um, provide a bit of a justification for this uh, second condition. Let's take a look uh, here at another erlotinib trial. As you remember, erlotinib was the investigational therapy in the Saturn trial. Uh, in this particular trial, this uh, uh, therapy was also tested in the population of patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And um, this trial employed the traditional design. But let us suppose that the hazard ratio that we see on the slide represent the results of an interim assessment. Here we see that the hazard ratios in the two subpopulations, biomarker positive and biomarker negative, are in fact quite close to each other. Uh, 
The first one, lambda plus is equal to 0.71. The other one, lambda minus is equal to 0.77. Both of them suggest fairly strong treatment effect. How do we now interpret those results? After we see those interim results, what would be our recommendation for the scientific hypothesis to be considered at the final analysis in this trial? For example, would it be most meaningful to pursue a broad claim and perform the final analysis in the overall population of patients? Or should we consider a more advanced claim or a more advanced conclusion, which means which, which has a twofold structure and may potentially involve two different tests? testing the effectiveness of this novel treatment in the overall population of patients, and in addition to that, also running a similar test within the subpopulation of biomarker-positive patients. The answer to this question can be found in the very definition of an enhanced claim or a conclusion of an enhanced effect in a multi-population trial. As I said earlier, the enhanced claim relies on the assumption of a strong differential treatment effect which means that a beneficial effect is observed across the entire patient population. But if we select biomarker-positive patients, then we will discover a much stronger efficacy signal. So biomarker-positive patients are more likely to benefit from this uh, novel therapy or intervention compared to biomarker-negative patients, which is exactly what is captured in the interaction condition. The interaction condition is met if the beneficial effect in the biomarker-positive subpopulation is appreciably greater than the effect in the biomarker-negative subpopulation. In this case, of course, an, an enhanced claim or conclusion would be warranted. The, the underlying mathematical condition is shown at the bottom of the slide. To evaluate this condition, we uh, look at the ratio of the effect sizes in the biomarker positive and biomarker negative subpopulations. They are noted, denoted, as we said before, by theta plus over theta minus. And the interaction condition will be met if this ratio exceeds a predefined threshold. It is known as the interaction threshold. It is very common to set it to a value uh, such as 1.2 or 1.3 which means in simple terms that the effect size in the biomarker positive subpopulation is expected to exceed the effect size in the complementary biomarker negative subpopulation by 20% or 30% respectively. And after that, we can conclude that a strong differential effect is present and therefore we can justify a decision to characterize the treatment's efficacy profile simultaneously in the two patient populations, overall population biomarker positive, which may lead then to an enhanced claim. The resulting population selection rule, in this case, I, sh I should say the second population selection rule, because the first one was based on the influence condition, is defined on this slide. As we see on this slide, if the interaction condition is not met, that implies that the selected biomarker is most likely non-informative. So the treatment effect is actually homogeneous across the two subpopulations, biomarker positive and biomarker negative subpopulations. So in practical terms, how do we then formulate appropriate enhanced claims or conclusions? Well, if the interaction condition is met, then there is evidence of a strong differential effect, uh, which means that it would be most meaningful to perform the final analysis in both populations that corresponds to an enhanced claim. And if the interaction condition is not met, then the final analysis will be performed in the overall population because most likely, once again, the biomarker that was chosen for this adaptive trial is non-informative, and that translates to a broad claim. If we return to example two to determine the best course of action in terms of identifying the scientific hypothesis for the final assessment in this Erlotinib uh, trial, let's take a look at the ratio of the effect sizes in the biomarker positive and biomarker negative subpopulations, again, applying the log uh, transformation we can easily verify that the effect size in the biomarker positive subset, theta plus, is 
the corresponding quantity in the biomarker negative subpopulation denoted by theta minus is 0.26. Now, looking at the ratio of those two uh, effect sizes, we can see that this ratio is greater than the interaction threshold if this threshold is equal to 1.3. If, if the sponsor had pre-specified this particular threshold, then an enhanced claim would have been justified, would have been recommended, which means that both populations, the overall population, the biomarker positive population, would have been selected for the final assessment. To wrap it up, the combined decision rules, the population selection rules based on the influence and interaction conditions are presented on the slide. It's exactly the same information that we went over. It's over, over, over the past uh, several minutes. It's just presented here uh, using this nice uh, visually appealing diagram. This diagram reminds us of an important fact that the two conclusions, uh, I'm sorry, the two conditions are to be applied sequentially. We always begin with the influence condition and uh, we either proceed directly to the restricted claim corresponding to the biomarker positive uh, evaluation in the final analysis, or we continue to the assessment of the interaction condition, in which case we could potentially end up with two different claims or conclusions the broad claim or the enhanced claim. I would like to point out here very quickly that the question frequently comes up when I introduce those two conditions, how to best select the values for the influence and interaction thresholds. Uh, certain rules of thumb exist that will be beyond the scope of this particular training course. In addition to that, um, certain criteria, optimization criteria uh, could be applied to uh, if, uh, to facilitate the process of optimally selecting the influence and interaction thresholds. And in this case, I would like to refer to a book chapter that I published with my colleague back in 2017. And now, very quickly, just a few words about the non-binding nature of decision rules for futility assessment at the first interim analysis and or population selection at the second interim analysis. As we have said before, it is perfectly okay for an external data monitoring committee or even for the trial sponsor for the research team to override the predefined decision rules without compromising the trial's integrity, the trial's scientific validity, but a general justification will be expected, as I pointed out back in parts 5 and 7. The last section in this video deals with the decision rules and statistical inferences at the final analysis. The most important consideration at the final analysis is related to multiplicity. The fact that we will evaluate the significance of the treatment effects in two patient populations, uh, of course, induces multiplicity in this trial, and the general regulatory General scientific guidelines are very clear about the requirements that appropriate statistical methods, or they're known as multiplicity adjustments, must be applied at the final analysis to control the alpha or the overall type of error rate in the trial. And I cannot overstate the importance of choosing a reliable multiplicity adjustment in the context of multi-population trials and adaptive population selection trials as well. And by this I mean a flexible multiplicity adjustment that would perform well regardless of the population-specific effects. I will give you a couple of examples of how things could potentially go wrong in multi-population trials when the chosen multiplicity adjustment is not flexible. It's all based on my own experiences with multi-population trials and uh, it is still rather common to consider the so-called fixed sequence or hierarchical testing approach in trials with several patient populations, which means that we predefine the sequence in which the treatment effects in those populations will be evaluated, and the sequence is set in stone. We may begin, for example, testing the beneficial effect in the biomarker positive subpopulation, if this effect is statistically significant, we will then proceed to the, to the overall population test. But when we do that, when we consider this option, we need to bear in mind that, once again, the testing sequence 
is pre-specified, it is set in stone, it cannot be changed. Which means that if we are out of luck in the subpopulation of biomarker positive patients, if there is no evidence of a statistically significant beneficial effect in biomarker positive patients, then we cannot proceed to the, to the overall population test. This testing approach could be quite risky, and um, I could mention could have mentioned multiple uh, clinical trials that applied this approach and that led to a negative outcome, not because the treatment or intervention was ineffective, simply because the predefined multiplicity adjustment strategy was not flexible enough to account for the complexity of the underlying problem. So essentially, it will be fair in this case to say that the trial failed because the sponsor did not carefully assess the pros and cons of uh, this particular testing strategy. And uh, you may think that we could mitigate this risk by considering a different sequence of population tests. For example, we could set up the testing approach in such a way that we first examine the treatment effect in the overall population of patients. And then if it is significant, we could then assess the effect within the biomarker positive subpopulation. But the bad news is that this approach could be risky as well. And we could fail in this case due to the dilution of the overall effect in the sense that the true beneficial effect may be limited to the subset of biomarker positive patients. There could be no benefit in the complementary biomarker negative subset. So the overall effect will be a mixture of a strong positive effect in biomarker positive patients and no effect in biomarker negative patients, which means that the strong beneficial effect in the biomarker positive subset will be diluted there's a good chance that the overall population test may be non-significant, which means that the first test in this predefined sequence will not be statistically significant and the trial's overall outcome will be negative. The trial sponsor will simply not be able to assess the beneficial effect within the biomarker positive subpopulation. So to summarize, based on my work on several multi-population trials, I would uh, recommend that you rely on a flexible testing approach, a flexible multiplicity adjustment, such as the Hogberg procedure mentioned on the slide. It is not only flexible, it also takes advantage of the fact that the test statistics in the two patient populations, the overall population and the biomarker positive population are correlated, they're positively correlated, and by then Taking this information into account, you're going to end up with a more efficient multiplicity adjustment. I will now walk you through the process of applying a multiplicity adjustment at the final analysis to account for data-driven population selection at the second interim analysis. What you see on this slide in the left-hand panel is a simple visual summary of the three-stage adaptive design that is employed in this case study. There are two sets of boxes here. The top row corresponds to the overall population assessments and the bottom row corresponds to the assessments within the biomarker positive subpopulation. And uh, at the end of the study, at the final analysis, we will then compute p-values for each population and they're denoted, as you can see in the right-hand panel here, P0 would be the p-value for assessing the treatment effect in the overall population, and P plus would denote the p-value for evaluating the treatment effect in the biomarker positive subset. Those p-values are, of course, defined provided that both of those populations were selected at the second inch analysis for the final assessment. Let us assume here for the sake of example, that only the oral population, only that hypothesis, was selected as the most scientifically meaningful for the final assessment. And this is the reason we see a gap here. Stage 3 is not defined for the biomarker positive assessment. So how do we then apply a multiplicity adjustment in, the, in, in cases like this one, when one of the populations simply is not available? For the final assessment, if a population was deselected, so it was not chosen at the second inch analysis, 
then its p-value is simply set to 1. In this case, the biomarker positive effect will not be assessed at the final analysis and therefore p plus will be set to 1. Only one p-value will be available at the final analysis and this will be p0. And now we're going to apply a predefined multiple testing procedure such as the Hogberg procedure to the resulting p-values. One of those p-values once again is equal to 1. And it's easy to verify that in this case, with the Hogberg procedure, a significant effect will be established in the overall population at the final analysis if the corresponding p-value, p0, is less than or equal to alpha over 2. So we're not going to be using the full alpha level. Here we need to account for the multiplicity, inherent multiplicity for this class of adaptive designs. And this is exactly the point I would like to make, uh, pretty much the last point in this video, and it is related to the need to predefine and apply a multiplicity adjustment in adaptive trials with data-driven population selection. And in fact, this point also applies to adaptive trials that support data-driven treatment selection. Here's the question, what if, just like in this particular example, only one patient population is selected for the final assessment? Would we still need to apply a multiplicity adjustment? After all, there's only one hypothesis to be tested in the final analysis. Do we really need to worry about multiplicity in this case? And the answer is yes. I've said it before, I'm going to repeat it. The answer is yes. We still need to worry about multiplicity because that single patient population, that single hypothesis, was chosen in a data-driven fashion. It was selected after we examined, or the DMC in this case, examined unblinded interim data. And we talked about the fundamental fact that every time we make decisions based on unblinded interim data, we run the risk of inflating the alpha, the type 1 error rate in the trial, and this is the reason why a formal multiplicity adjustment would be required in adaptive trials with dose selection or population selection, even in those extreme cases when only one hypothesis survives, if you will, is selected for the end of the trial. We have now reached the end of part 9. We're done with the discussion of statistical methodology and uh, general operational considerations for adaptive designs that support decision rules for identifying the best population or the best populations in a multi-population clinical trial. The next module, part 10, is the last module in this training program. We will review software tools for clinical trial simulation that are used for designing adaptive trials with data-driven population selection. I appreciate your interest in this online training program. Would like to encourage you to check the other videos, including the last video in this program, and share information on this online training program with your colleagues.